My beloved clergy, it is with paternal and pastoral love that I reach out to you on behalf of the Holy Eparchial Synod to thank you, to thank you for your tireless efforts serving our people during this ongoing pandemic crisis. We, as the hierarchs of the Archdiocese, are very aware of the many struggles that our clergy are experiencing these days. We have been called to minister during a most extraordinary time in the life of the Church, and the challenges that we face are unique. Among our faithful, we find first responders, medical professionals, and others who continue to face the crisis daily. We find many who have lost friends and loved ones without being able to say goodbye. And we find that many of our brother clergy are dealing with these experiences without fully realizing it. For this reason, we have created a task force to assist you and offer you tools to help you as you respond to the many demands that you are facing. Dear brothers, I keep each of you close to my heart in my prayers day and night. I pray that you will use these videos for your edification and as tools to assist the great number of people that will be calling upon you in the coming weeks and months. May God continue to strengthen and guide each and every one of you at this time and always. In this episode, we will focus on offering support and guidance to parishioners who are frontline workers. These essential employees, like grocery clerks and hospital staff, to name a few, have taken personal risks during this pandemic to help others. Now they need support from you. While it may seem daunting to offer emotional and spiritual care, what is most helpful is having a priest who cares enough to reach out, listen, and offer a peaceful, prayerful presence. It helps to have an idea of the types of struggles, thoughts, and feelings our frontline professionals might be experiencing. Understanding and identifying these typical emotions can serve as a type of roadmap for drawing close to your parishioners. Let's talk about 1. Loss and grief, 2. Stress, and 3. Fear and anxiety. Loss and grief. One of the defining characteristics of this pandemic is the amount of loss we all have experienced. Some parishioners have lost their jobs. We have lost our regular routines, our freedom to come and go as we please, and our social connections. Some of our frontline hospital workers have witnessed illness and death. Keep in mind that frontline workers may have lost their regular routines to unwind and recharge. It's hard to recognize how important these routines are until we lose them. Some may have been going to the gym after a long work day, visiting in person with close friends, or going to church. To lose these anchors of self-care can feel distressing and overwhelming. How you can help. Check in specifically how their life has changed and what they have lost. Ask how and what questions, like, how has this pandemic affected you and your family? What do you need in terms of support? How are you taking care of yourself? What are you doing to unwind? Respect their losses no matter how small they might seem. When they do share their particular pain points, offering silence or gentle statements such as, thank you for sharing that are appropriate. Help them establish new, realistic routines like morning prayer, exercising at home, or going for a walk. Make a personal commitment to check in with them on a regular basis. Stress. By definition, stress is our psychological and physical response to perceived pressures. In addition to feeling grief and loss, stress can be caused by long work hours or an intense work environment that includes caring for people infected by and dying from the virus. Small amounts of stress are good and provide us with short-term energy and heightened focus in times of need. Like, for example, when we're getting ready for a church festival, However, long-term wears down the body and affects the mind and soul, which can lead to burnout. Imagine having a festival every weekend. Here are signs and symptoms of stress. 
feeling depressed, anxious, angry or irritable, restless, overwhelmed, unmotivated or unfocused, having trouble sleeping or sleeping too much, racing thoughts or constant worry, problems with memory or concentration, poor decision making, how you can help. Again, take the initiative to check in with your parishioners specifically about what might be stressing them. When they're talking about their stressors, if they are overly agitated or emotional in the telling, encourage calm activities that will help quiet the stress. If they seem withdrawn or depressed, it's best to encourage them to find activities that are energizing and stimulating. Guide your parishioners to learn how to nurture their souls in this time of stress. For example, quiet prayer, reading scriptures, spiritual readings, lives of the saints, or listening to hymns of the church. Help your parishioners use their five senses to relieve stress. Seeing photos of family and friends help. Smelling incense. Eating a favorite meal. Petting their dog. Listening to their favorite music. Fear and anxiety. Stress can be caused by fear and anxiety. How we think about or perceive events affects the way we experience them. When we fear events, this increases our stress. For example, frontline workers may be fearful of contracting the virus or infecting their friends and families. Fear can be particularly destructive when we can't predict the stressful events. We don't know how long they will last, and we don't have any support. These are characteristics of the current pandemic for many frontline workers. Ways you can help. Listen carefully to understand what are they worried about? What are they afraid of? Guide them to turn towards God when they are worried or scared through prayer or speaking with you. For example, learn about and identify their support system at work, at home, in their community. Remind them that you are part of their support system. As they recount their experiences, identify and inquire about what they are grateful for. Gratitude can empower confidence and inner peace. If you feel as though your parishioner's everyday living is being overwhelmed, consider referring them to a mental health professional. This referral does not replace the participation in the life-giving sacrament of the church, but works with the church to improve the overall health of your parishioner. You don't have to know what it's like to be a frontline worker to offer meaningful and substantial pastoral care, but you do need to reach out and make contact with them. The simple act of sharing our stresses and struggles, fears, and losses with a caring person offers relief. In fact, the very act of someone caring enough to think about us and reach out to us with a phone call provides real relief. Lastly, remember that staying involved with your parishioners requires that you also check in with yourself. Listening to people's struggles places a real burden on clergy. Ask yourselves the questions that you are asking your parishioners. Clergy are experiencing similar losses, stress, and fears at this time, and deserve the very same kind of care and attention that they are providing to others. During a pandemic, we need to heighten our own healthy self-care. What you offer is so important and useful to each frontline professional with whom you come into contact. Thank you for being there for those on the front lines, and remember, you're not alone. Welcome. My name is Dr. Philip Mamalakis, the Assistant Professor of Pastoral Care here at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. And today I have with me Dr. Euthym Kontaxis. Deacon Euthym Kontaxis is the Medical Director of the Emergency Department of Eisenhower Medical Center in Rancho Mirage, California. He is also a 1999 graduate of Holy Cross and uh, was ordained to the diaconate in 1999. Welcome, Deacon Euthym. Thank you, Philip. It's nice to see you. Thank you for being with us. Well, let me jump right in. We're talking about pastoral care for uh, medical frontline workers. What do you see as the struggles that frontline workers are facing during this pandemic? You know, Philip, a lot of people have asked me that question, and, and I want people to understand that this is nothing new. This is this is what frontline workers have been doing for years and years and years. Um, uh, and I think one thing I'd like to share with our clergy brethren and our, our, those that do pastoral care from the communities is they're basically doing the same thing. 
Um, we are we are called to care for people in crisis, and the crisis changes depending on the season, depending on the pandemic, depending on the trauma, depending on what is going on in someone's life. And so, from an emergency physician's perspective, we 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 are brought many different uh, problems at any given time, and so. I'd like to approach this just a little bit. The struggle of a caregiver is this idea that somehow um, the person that we're caring for is taking away from us. This is a mentality I think that leads to burnout. And um, one of the things that I've talked to a lot of our physicians about and the struggles that people have in caregiving, priests, deacons, uh, our bishops, and uh, frontline workers, nurses, techs, emergency physicians, uh, paramedics, we all have an approach. And sometimes the approach is that the person in need is taking something from me, taking my time, taking my emotions, taking my efforts. And um, I think the approach is wrong. I think what I find that allows for people to do it without this burning out or feeling depleted is that this is an opportunity to um, to missionize. Um, a lot of people, when they're feeling burned out, what do they do? They go across the world on a mission to get rejuvenated, and they do it for free. But here in, in this world, in whatever world we're in, whether we're a priest in a community or a, a ER doctor, we can missionize in our own, people are coming to us for help and we can do that. And the attitude should be, what has God put in front of me right now and how can I best serve this person and commit fully emotionally to that person? So I think from the struggle, I think the struggle is this worldly way of looking at, at caregiving as a something that's taking away from us as opposed to something that's giving to us and so enhances us you're saying the way we think about our job as a physician or maybe even in pastoral care really can affect the, the stress we feel and the exhaustion we feel and if we perceive it as this is something being taken from me right and maybe you're noticing a lot of your colleagues with yeah. that 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 actually has a different effect on us than if we see actually our ministry as an outreach as a giving as an act of love. Mm -hmm. And so, we take an action. So when I go to see the patient or when I go to see the parishioner, at that moment, the world disappears. I'm fully engaged. My heart is open. I'm listening. And I, I'm totally committed to that person for whatever time it is, whether it's 30 seconds, whether it's an hour, whether it's a, who knows? It depends on what the need is. And oftentimes when we're fully open and engaged, that interaction becomes a, I mean, I'd like to use the word holy. Uh, it becomes uh, special. It becomes sa uh, sacred. sacred. And in that moment, a lot of beautiful things can happen because really the mechanics of care are very simple. Uh, uh, you know, I've been doing emergency medicine for 38 years, so I, I know how to take care of people. That's not the problem. The problem is what is my attitude while I'm taking care of people? If it's, the, if it's this giving, loving, sacred moment, then the whole thing becomes uh, beautiful and sanctified. And that's true for the clergy as well. So I would say when you reach out to a caregiver, the struggle is, is this a mission or is this a duty or a job or a burden? So Am I giving often, something or is something being taken from me? Yes. So you, and you're saying, if I can be present and offer myself, yes. actually as a pastor reaching out to front line, yep. that it becomes actually life-giving. But wait a minute, what about all the stuff in my head? What about all the uncertainties? What about all the stress? What about the fact that I really don't have unlimited time? And the fact that I got to get home to my wife who's wondering where I am? And what about, what do I, what about all that stuff? It melts away. If we're if we commit if we say I'm giving it up to the Lord, I honestly believe with my whole heart that when you go into whatever you're doing with a brief prayer, do your cross, just say Lord help me, and 
and when you're done, you say, Lord, help them and help me. To I'm intentional them. with yep. a small act, almost like little rituals yep. of external practices that, that kind of facilitate an internal process. It allows me to do that. But you come on, you got to tell me you're never affected by your work. Well, what Always. happens if things are lingering? What, what do I do oh. if I come home and something's troubling me? Something's bothering me or I'm irritated I, or I rec- what if I something rec- sticks? I recognize that I didn't commit at the moment and I should ask for forgiveness from God for not giving myself fully at that moment. There are things that are tragic. Don't get me wrong. Right. You see uh, devastating stuff and things that are overwhelming. Yes. But to think that somehow I have control over that is, is beyond the scope of my brain. And I gave up a long time ago trying to think that I understood the mind of God and the, and the will of God and the wisdom of God. So I'm a witness. I'm not, I didn't cause, I'm a witness. And as a witness, there's a lot of good things you can do as a witness. And so, yes, we see the bad things and, and priests hear the bad things sometimes in confession and see the, the horror of the world in their own way. And so do emergency physicians and nurses. But ultimately, you either are in the game or you're not in the game. So, well, you're saying if I can let go of the need to control, if I can let go of the need to even understand and just be present as a yep. witness, there's yep. a lot of things I can do as a witness. What can I do as a witness? What, is I a, what, can, can, I, what does a witness do? A witness can, can participate and try to help, you know, a the uh-huh. bystander, the, the good Samaritan that, you know, I mean, there was... The so there might be something I can attend to in the moment, but at least I, if I'm present, I'll notice it. I went, I went to the person. I'm going to the person. I'm intentional Beautiful. about helping. Then on the other side, I can realize that I am not responsible for the cause or the outcome. Uh, priest is not responsible for the cause of the pain of his flock, nor is he responsible for the outcome. He is offering, the deacon or the priest is offering Christ as the cure. In, so when I see a stressed out doctor, I don't know anything about doctors, I don't know anything about their world, if I can just let go of that and know that I can just be, draw close, be present, and attentive and go from there just to walk with them? When you, when you walk with a doctor, when you say, I want to be, you know, there are two sides to the bed. The physician, and then there's another side. Who's at the other side? It should be the priest. And if you, and that caregiver, knowing that there is a priest at his side or her side, in a sense, is really supportive. In other words, when they're alone in the room, it's difficult. But if I know that my priest or my deacon is there with me, is calling me, is saying, you know, I know you're going through this. I know it's difficult. I know you're working hard. I'm here for you. Let's say a prayer over the phone. Let's, let's, here's a little scripture reading. I get one lady in my parish. She's in her seventies. She sends me this thing every morning at 6 a.m. she texts me uh, the something for the day it's a it's almost like a cartoon icon and it's a picture and it's like have a beautiful day the holy spirit is with you just something well this lady is ministering to me every time i see it i go i'm inspired i said what a beautiful woman that she's thinking to me every morning that somehow my day will be better those little things are little happy. things they support. So you what about the fact it. that so much happens in my day, right? You see a bunch of people, they're all going through sort of stuff that I'm coming home and it's all swirling through my head. And it's almost like, it's almost a lot to hold. I call that, I call that the lake problem. People that are lakes, everything stays in the lake. And pretty soon it starts to get pretty stinky after a while. Rather be a river. So as it comes, it has to go. You're not responsible, you know, pray for it as it passes by. Why are you holding on to what happened this morning when this afternoon there's plenty to do? Why am I holding on to the patient from three weeks ago 
when today I have 10 new ones coming in that want my attention and help. Those belong to God. The ones tomorrow belong to God. The ones right now belong to me and God. So Deacon Utham, can you tell me why did you become a deacon after you were already a medical professional, after you're a doctor? So Philip, you know, as a, as a physician, you're always wanting to care for people. And I felt like medically, I, I was in my late 30s. I was 40 years old when I went to seminary. I was a partner in a group. And I, I felt that the spiritual side of my caregiving was becoming more and more essential to my practice, that I felt that that was enhancing my care of patients. And in the sense that I wanted to have the best medicines, the medicines I use as a physician are incomplete. The medicine of immortality, the Eucharist, is the complete medicine, who is Jesus Christ. So I felt that as a deacon, I wanted to learn more, A, and B, I wanted to be able to have another medicine in my armamentarium that was the best medicine, the medicine that was eternal. So, so simple answer, but that, that's what drove me was caregiving. And what, what, what have you learned from being an ER doc that's relevant to pastoral care or to relevant to our times? Well, I think, you know, in life in general, things happen that we don't expect. And the ER is a microcosm of life where we don't know what's coming in the door. We don't know what's going to happen next. We have an idea. Most of us have an idea of what our day is going to be like or our life's going to be like. But there are these sudden moments that come that we don't expect that because either we're, in, we're unprepared or we're deluded, one or the other. But these moments come, and when they come, we want to have mechanisms to deal with them. And I think that's where the ER has been a wonderful kind of learning ground as a, as a deacon and as, an, uh, as a person for me to say when, life, when things come up in life, I have to be able to be prepared spiritually, physically, emotionally, and mentally to deal with them. And don't be surprised, and it's not always on me. God will take care of us. and. Uh, the shift always and it, and it doesn't matter that you don't know what's coming in the door but no. you're prepared to be present and to receive whatever the lord has in mind for me i'm and not only am i not worried about what's coming through the door but i'm reaching out to deal with it i'm not running that's the most important thing in life when we have problems when we have issues when we have challenges don't run from them move forward with the grace of god and deal with them as, as a loving human being and see what God reveals in that flower of the moment. Sometimes it looks pretty ugly at the beginning, but then we have this bloom that you can't believe. Any final words you have for clergy in terms of reaching out? You know, you kind of given an instruction, go out to them and reach yeah. out to your medical frontline professionals. Make a call or reach out to them when you see them. Yes. Any other final in words for the clergy? I think we have to be disruptive. Uh, people don't want to be, if you see a caregiver or you're trying to reach out to a caregiver, don't feed into their rut. Um, disrupt them. Say, bring, bring the, the, the higher things to them. Don't try to talk to them about what uh, the latest medical treatment for COVID is. Who cares? That's not your problem. Your goal should be, um, you know, how can you uplift other people's souls? Make them your uh, minister in the moment in the ER. I, I would love it if, if I was an ER physician and I had a priest that said to me, I want you to minister to these people in this way and here's some specific things you can do. Pray for them while you're caring for them. Uh, as, you, as you finish your care for them, say, Lord, I commend them in your hands. Um, I think for, for the priest, um, I think a lot of times, especially now during COVID, they've been isolated. There's no churches. They don't have that constant feedback. This is a wonderful time for prayer and fasting and really kind of almost monastic approach to allowing God to do their ministry for them if they can't do it in person. And then finding 
uh, avoiding the mindless distractions and finding mindful distractions. So I don't care if it's planting a garden, writing a letter, making a phone call to somebody that will uplift them. I don't, but mindless distractions are difficult. And I think bring us away from that, that beautiful peace that you get when you are intentional about witnessing Christ, not only to our families, but to the, the caregivers and those around us. And I think our priests really have a beautiful role and would, would be great if they could part, partner with the caregivers moving forward. This might be an impetus for saying, how can we partner to care for the community better? How can we partner? That would lift the, the caregivers into a level where they're feeling like I'm ministering, I'm not just uh, putting in the, punching in the clock. And for the clergy, it says, I have, I have people that, are, that I can inspire to carry on the ministry like the apostles did. They, there were only 12 of them. How did millions of people believe in Christ? Because they empowered others to preach the gospel. You right. need to be reminded, this is nothing different. Remember who you are. Go boldly. Right. This and is I wanted not... to normalize how hard that is. There's an asceticism to self-denial, and you get better at it as you practice it. Well, and I think people are, I think the, the world is telling them burnout, burnout, burnout. So they start to say, I'm burning out, I'm burning out, I'm depressed. Yeah, oh, I'm no upset. question. Deacon Youthum, thank you so much for your time. And I'd like to thank everyone for this uh, series. Um, and I'd like to thank the Archdiocese for this uh, effort to support clergy to connect, to educate, and to equip. Thank you very much. Thanks.